Hi, everybody. I am Dr. Boz, and I am live here on Sunday night. Uh, I am not in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. As you'll notice, I'm not in my clinic. Uh, I, however, uh, am in Plankington, South Dakota, my hometown, in my, uh, my, the farmhouse I grew up in. And we are live on Sunday night with some of, uh, <clears throat> some, I have a great show planned for you tonight with, um, uh, volume is off, somebody said. Uh, so just checking out, just make sure that everybody can hear me and see me. Okay, perfect. All right, if you got some thumbs up there. Um, I, I do have a couple of things we're gonna go through tonight. I have a really good show and uh, as usual, or what I've been trying to do recently is try to leave place for your questions at the end of uh, the live shows on Sunday. Uh, over the last year, I've had a amazing growth of the channel and the brand and just the education about the ketogenic diet. And I have a flood of folks that send in questions from many different places, but it's on YouTube at the end of the show that I will answer these questions every week. And so save your questions. I hope that they per pertain to tonight's topic. We're going to talk about how our traditions can be toxic. And if there's ever been a year where we can just rip off the Band-Aid and start a new tradition, uh, let's use 2020 because that might be the best way to end this year. And I'm gonna do some uh, review of the toxic traditions that I've taught you about in the past, but uh, how they pertain to each stage of our life. So we're gonna start out the show like I usually do, which is honest, transparent, and a little, um, sometimes a little telling. Last week I was having a tough week and shared with you uh, how the toxic traditions of uh, that are around death and loss had really kind of taken my uh, journey and, and wrinkled them quite a bit. Uh, I'm just showing you that I've got the meters set up. I don't know if you can see those without reflection. We're gonna prick my finger and show you live what my numbers are. Um, this is, uh, again, not what's needed in everybody on the ketogenic diet. Uh, you can use urine ketone strips. And in fact, I would encourage that um, early in the ketogenic journey. <clears throat> We're gonna start with, actually, I'm gonna use the ketone one first. It takes a little bit more Time and so this is the purple strip. Uh, for those kind of looking at that, you want that mm, you want that drip blinking at you. Can you see that blinking? Yeah, do that before you put that up to your uh, your blood drop. And once you hear a ding, it's ten seconds for the ketone, and the glucose is only five seconds. Uh, these are the exact same meter. I just use two meters during the show to help uh, uh, to help uh, make it go a little faster. So yeah, last week I think I was. Um, around the same glucose, but my ketones were 0.2. <laughs> I was having a really tough week. Here we're at 0.6, which is a little better. And um, I'm showing you exactly that the tradition of uh, falling off uh, my pattern has has been the real part of my journey. Each week in uh, on the channel, I try to show you how one of the products works. Um, this is uh, another example of ketones in a can. Uh, this is my original uh, product that I put out uh, called raspberry lemonade. We're just going to use, I use about a three-fourths of a scoop and we'll stir it into some water here. And I will drink on that throughout, uh, throughout the show and then test the numbers at the end. The reason I do this is not because I enjoy pricking my finger any more than anybody else does but because you should keep track of whether your supplements make a difference. Uh, you are not on the ketogenic diet based on what you eat. You are on the ketogenic uh, journey if your uh, chemistry supports you are in that direction. So uh, welcome and I will begin the show. So um, a couple of other announcements that I have folks tune in every week and lots of questions coming in about when the book will be published. Uh, again, I had, my goal had been July of 2020, but um, several setbacks, the death of my dad. And then the uh, seven weeks ago today, my mom died. So I'm actually in my parents' house right now and still reeling through what happens when you have setbacks in life. And I'm no different than anybody else. It's hard. Uh, practicing forgiveness for myself might be the one of the hardest things that any of us does, but I think it's a great um, opportunity to show you the, the example of this isn't perfect. Life isn't always perfect, but there is a way out. Um, and that does spin into uh, a big goal of mine has been this book. So I had practically since I wrote the last book, which was Any Way You Can, 
I'd been working on a, a process or an algorithm or a protocol, if you would, for my internal medicine patients. And we walk them through uh, when they want to get off medications, when they're looking to not just live, but live healthy. And those have seasons where people can take on a, a, a new chapter and then sometimes when they just can't. Uh, so through that process, I would use my own local support group to um, to teach some of that algorithm, some of that process, and I would use you. I would use the YouTube channel to show you some of the steps along the process. We're going to review that tonight a little bit uh, as we review some of the traditions and how to do them differently. Uh, but in that, uh, getting back to how well my book is coming, I have completely finished editing, recording, and ready for audiobook and um, and the written version uh, through, I think I have five chapters left, uh, maybe it's six chapters left, um, to finish the final edit and then audio record it. So I'm hoping by next Friday, <laughs> so the next time I do this show, which I'm trying to have an accountability partner as you tonight, that I will be done recording, done editing, and ready to uh, set up the pre-sales for the book uh, and get them in the in the universe <laughs> to say, here's what I've been working on. Here's what I do in my clinic. Here's really what I did with my mom when she was sick. And um, the process of, uh, of taking what I do in my clinic and teaching other leaders within the ketogenic uh, world has been a goal of mine. I really think this book and the workbook have been a huge part of the tools that I want to get in the hands of, of patients, but also of leaders of the ketogenic journey. Uh, I have a couple of other little things coming your way. This week we started the filming of a uh, documentary that will show somebody walking through the ketogenic journey. We're trying to launch that here on YouTube free for the folks following, but we'll show the, the weekly process of uh, how to use the, the online course for those of you that have done the online course, or if you're going to wait for the book uh, or use the book in conjunction with the online course, which is I think is the best way to do it. Uh, to really take your health to its uh, paramount, to the best health you can have. And of course, that journey uh, is best shown through the examples. The, the story of my mom, in any way you can, taught many people. Uh, the book has a story of another uh, patient who's walked through my clinic and also improved his life and helped so many people through his story. Uh, when the book comes out, it'll be even more people that he helps and then we have this documentary, which I think is another place to say it's it, there's a beginning, uh, there's some predictable pro problems that happen, and we've just started the filming, so we think it should be able to be ready to air at, at the time the book should be released, not just the pre-order, but released in, in mid to late January. So those are some updates. I'm super excited. I'm really ready to be done with the book, <laughs> but the next chapter I think is filled with using this organized thought process in an economical way to improve the lives of folks. So I'm super excited to share all that with you. Um, and tonight we're going to uh, use um, a couple of things that some of you have uh, written in and asked for, and I'm using this toxic tradition uh, process uh, to give you a little bit more about how um, how I would how I would hone in if you've fallen off the ketogenic diet and you're trying again. Maybe you're waiting for New Year's because you're like, I just can't do it. The holidays are coming. I know it's going to be too carb filled. Um, I would encourage you to not do it that way. Um, there is a, a, a URL or a web link below that has bazmd.com forward slash toxic traditions. This is a free download. And in this download, you'll get the PDF of the, the keto continuum that I'm going to talk about in just a minute. Uh, I really think this is uh, the best roadmap that's out there. And I've uh, learned long ago that um, if you show people where others are having their struggle, these mirror neurons in your brain pick up what it is that they didn't know and how can they improve that for uh, the next steps of their journey. So... Uh, let's get to the toxic traditions and show you some of uh, where people fall off and where these traditions have circled into our lives and really uh, crashed, <laughs> if you would. Uh, I, I like to point out five toxic traditions that are known for ruining people's momentum and their, their keto journey. And then I have some antidotes that we'll quickly go through as well. 
And again, as you think of questions that uh, come to your mind, you can go ahead and type them in the chat, but I'm gonna want you to copy and paste them and repost them at the end of the show because I'll look at them then and I'll try to answer those questions then. <clears throat> All right, so the five toxic traditions that I organize uh, the disasters from include holidays. So uh, nothing like uh, last uh, week at Thanksgiving and the upcoming holiday of Christmas or the whatever winter solstice uh, holiday you guys celebrate. Uh, but as it comes, the, the collection of family and tradition uh, instantly linked to carbs and sweets and, and, a, and a celebration. Um, I, uh, I, we then talk about um, having a success uh, the successes in life are, are something much like I, I think of what's happening with my book as I continue to work towards a really big goal. And I think about uh, not, you know, what happens after I push publish, but what happens uh, when the, the, the goal that you reach for has finally been, um, has finally been met. And those successes can be some of the toughest things to throw you right off of your rhythm. Um, that we're then going to quickly touch on alcohol. Last week we talked about um, loss, and I had had plenty of carbs <laughs> the previous week as I struggled with some uh, just dealing with the death of my mom. And I shared with you last week that she she was my keto why. I really did keto to teach her, and and my why died. And when that happens, finding a way to channel my why is something I'm I'm continuing to work through. So I, I shared that with you last week. I won't repeat that. Um, but then we got into some eating patterns. And that's kind of where tonight's uh, uh, message is going to spend most of the time. Uh, as I look at uh, some of the, uh, the, the places, when, when, when I look at what happens during a holiday and why people fall off their wagon, is that uh, dopamine, or how we feel pleasure, is comes in uh, sex, drugs, rock and roll, and carbs. When you look at you know how to celebrate with uh, dopamine, uh, looking at other places that you can feel joy and pleasure uh, is a is a process that you count down to and you have uh, you have uh, anticipation for. Creating new dopamine uh, is about creating new traditions. Uh, what I look at in my family and some of the things that we like to do are. We don't just uh, rip open presents. We try to make this a, 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 a puzzle that the kids have to figure out or a treasure hunt is a favorite at our house. And even if there's only a couple links in the treasure hunt, they're not, it's not a really long one, uh, the process of the discovery of what happens in that holiday moment, um, of the tradition of you know, doing carols, which is, a, not, uh, is very traditional in my ancestors, but in my personal life, uh, since I moved away from my small little town, we don't do that. And you know, returning some of those traditions in 2020, I think is a perfect way to flip the cards and say how, now that we, most of us can't travel or, or traveling has its increased risks, uh, having large families get together has got, got other risks, especially for the older generation. And as we calculate that, how do we create a new dopamine pathway in your tradition? I'm not gonna put most of the time into that, but I, I do want you to know that's part of what's in that download of toxic traditions is talking about that. We then move on to successes. And as you look at some of the antidotes to fight when people fall off their rhythm because of a success, it sounds weird. Like you just had what's your goal, you just got there. But over and over again, we see people reach a goal and then almost get depressed, almost get down because in, in the best journeys that don't have the explosion of success and then the crash of what happens after success, uh, they took on the process, uh, they took on the, the intentional uh, process of enjoying little steps along the way, little successes along the way. And even though there's been several setbacks in the book and how, again, I wanted this done six months ago, I, I thought there's no way it, would, it wouldn't be here at Christmas and now I'm worried it's not gonna be even pre-sold at Christmas, um, that uh, the, the, the rescue for that setback during this big process has been that I really do enjoy the process. I, I hone in the teaching. I've got a couple of really good editors that are making me slow down and really focus at what some of these chapters are 
tackling. Uh, I mean, I think it's the sixth time I've rewritten this uh, book because I really want the teachings to last, not just for this year, but to be reused in other examples and and help people get out of the, the ditch of having a high insulin chronic uh, inflamed state. And you'll know more about what that means when you read the book. <laughs> so as I look at uh, the next one, I look at alcohol. And I think uh, holiday traditions uh, and alcohol go together like carbs and cake. I mean, they just go together. <laughs> when you look at that tradition of alcohol constantly being in a part or a section of your life, uh, I call for a, a three-week timeout, like no alcohol for three weeks, watch what happens to that. I kind of unpack that a little more in that uh, toxic traditions that there is something biochemical about the pause, like slow down, take a step back. Uh, if you uh, have a sudden moment of panic when I say no alcohol for three weeks, I want you to think about that a little bit. <laughs> Um, so next we have what happens with the toxic traditions of loss. Uh, when you're when you're in my setting, which I've lost both parents this year, um, you know, my clinic had quite a setback from COVID. So there's lots of downs in this past year. And I look at how is it that I don't get stuck, that I don't just want to stay in bed and pull the covers over my head and say, forget it, I'm done trying. And I've been there, don't get me wrong. I, that's That was an option a few days of the year. But to look at how you rescue out of a slump, uh, it has to do with your support groups. Now, I talk about that in that little toxic tradition download. Um, but what I want to really focus on tonight are eating patterns. Um, so eating patterns are another one of our traditions. And when you look at how we eat, what, what happens when uh, you look at a, the pattern of a day, you look at the pattern of a holiday, but you also look at the pattern of how do you eat when you're stressed? How do you eat when you celebrate? How do you eat when uh, you're ticked off? <laughs> and, and then study what that does to a momentum of changing an eating pattern. And that leads us to Keto Continuum, which is the name of my book. Uh, so let's go over and take a look at Keto Continuum. Uh, this is the download that is also in that toxic tradition. It just gives you your own copy. You can write on it and look closer at it. Um, when uh, you download that. And I would uh, I would encourage you to do that. Hold on here, let's pull that here. And I am gonna show you just a brief overview. Several of you have seen this before. I use this every week in my uh, support group as I have people check in, where are they at in their continuum. And when they've fallen off, I like them to show me how far they fell. So I'm just going to briefly, for those of you that haven't seen this before, show you that there's some, some overviews to this. Uh, you can see the keto continuum there uh, in, the, in the second column. But most importantly, I want you to see that there are three major topics along the side. You have beginners at the top. I'm just going to go a little bit bigger here so you guys can really make sure I'm focusing in the same spot as you. Uh, that keto continuum uh, is the name of it, but you have the beginner section. Those are the top four keto continuums. Uh, we then have uh, baseline metabolisms, which is where I want people hanging out for most of their life. Um, and then when I when I feel they're ready, uh, we show them how to stress their metabolism and that we don't ask them to stress their metabolism, which is one of these uh, nine through 12 options. We do not ask them to do this until they have been at a, at a baseline metabolism for at least uh, a season, a, a chapter where they're very confident and, and comfortable at staying the course with one of these. Um, so I'm gonna start by showing you a couple of other things that I wanted you to look at at a glance. Um, I, I've said several times when people are on a journey that um, they'll, they'll go from urine ketone measurements to blood ketone measurements. And you see me every week, check mine and you know be vulnerable right in front of you that when it's not as good as it should be, I, <laughs> I, I'm human, but I'm showing you and I'm saying this is part of the process. And I look at my uh, metabolism every week through a blood meter. So if you look at those, the test strip there where it says, I think I can mark up on here a little bit, um, where it says none up here. Um, but what you also can look at is that there is the urine ketone strips here, and then there is the, uh, the blood ketone strips at the bottom there. And when you uh, back out and, and study that, it's not a perfect spot where you go from urine to blood, but once you get an established metabolism happening, I really do want people measuring their blood mark 
workers, especially if they've fallen off the wagon or they've uh, or they can't figure out why things aren't improving, why they're stuck. Uh, but for the most part, I want you to focus how long I keep them in, checking urine ketones, this easy, cheap um, process to look at their ketones. Um, when I look at, uh, let's take off those red marks here really quick. When I look at um, this, uh, this beginner's section, um, I, I point out to my beginners that I do not want them pricking their finger. I don't want them looking uh, deep into their metabolic blood metabolism because I want them analyzing their life. I want them analyzing their choices. And uh, I'm just going to give you a, a brief second while I take a drink here to say, look at uh, Keto Continuum 1, 2, and 3, and then notice that the lines around 4 are have a little red line around them. So the, the point that, um, um, that I like to show people is that this section right here uh, shows you that the chemistry will carry you. Uh, and that sounds kind of weird, but I, I, I really am, uh, am so uh, excited for when people are about to start their keto continuum, because even if they've fallen all the way off the wagon and they're back to, you know, 100 carbs a day or maybe 300 carbs a day, but they're sure as heck not under 20 carbs a day. So they have fallen all the way back to the first link on the keto continuum. Um, as soon as they uh, hunker back down to a 20 carbs or less per day, the chemistry inside your system will carry you. You really do not have to do anything. I like them peeing on a urine ketone strip so that they can see the chemistry. Um, but one thing that happens when people have been on the keto diet and then tried to come back to it is that often they do fall all the way back to this beginner section. And uh, the volatility of what happens, if you would measure uh, ketones every second, first of all, you would have times where they're super high, like 3.6. And they'll say, oh my goodness, am I dying? My ketones are so high. And of course, you ask somebody who's been in, in the journey for a while, and they're like, they kind of get bushy eyebrows and say, well, I don't know, but mine aren't that high. And it's kind of a little competition, which it shouldn't be. Um, when people are first in the ketogenic journey, there is a huge volatility of what's going on to those ketones. And I would tell them, don't look, don't look at your blood meters. All you're going to do is get distracted and you're going to be uh, discouraged because of how much you don't need uh, that much ketones to, to let that chemistry carry you. Um, uh, what, I, what I encourage people to do uh, is check those urine ketones until somewhere in this area. Um, and that is that, you know, 16.8 or that advanced 16. We're going to go through these steps in just a minute. But that urine ketone measurement is accountability. It shows you that you've had um, your urine, uh, that, that there is, there, there can't be ketones in your urine if they weren't first in your blood. And one of the, um, one of the beautiful parts about uh, keto chemistry is ketones are a fuel that is much more powerful and long, longer acting than a glucose. It also takes less resources, specifically less oxygen to get the energy out of those ketones. So let the chemistry carry you. Um, and when, uh, when I fell off of my journey uh, in the last seven weeks, I didn't, uh, I had been at uh, before I tell you that, let's just review these really quick. So keto continuum number one through three is, again, this beginner section where I, again, want you just checking your in ketones. I'm going to make it a little bit bigger just to kind of keep everybody's focus here. Um, the second, you know, step number two is um, that they have 20 carbs or less. And again, that's total carbs. Uh, often they'll go from keto, you know, if if you don't know where you landed and you kind of didn't look at the keto continuum, one of the ways that I mark if they fell all the way back to keto continuum number one is they're back to snacking every two to four hours, which is about how long glucose lasts in your system. And if you're back to being predominantly glucose fueled instead of keto adapted, your meals are much closer together because you run out of energy. And that drop in energy creates a craving and then they'll want to eat. And they'll say, but doc, it says keto on the package. And I'm like, I don't care what the package says. I want to know what your chemistry says. And that means you got to measure. So um, when they do get to eating 20 carbs or less, uh, their eating pattern changes to about every six to eight hours. And that uh, process, again, isn't universal, but it's, it, it is a pretty good barometer to say, how close to keto adapted are they? How often do they want to eat? 
And especially when kids don't like their mom's checking and they want to say, well, I wonder what, what their fuel pattern is like. The kids have a much easier metabolism to rescue. And when they stop trying to eat every two to two to four hours, um, it's usually a sign that uh, the, the, the fuel process within their mitochondria is learning and really reaching for that resource of a ketone more often. Uh, number three is this place where I think uh, usually if you're at my group and, you, and this happens, I'll jump up and cheerlead for you because I think it's awesome, is the day they accidentally me miss a meal. And if you talk to somebody who's never been on a ketogenic journey, they'll think this isn't possible. They'll think that, you know, there's some kind of weird discipline thing that they did to not eat a meal. But truly and, and effortlessly, the human body can go without a meal when the fuel is there. And when that body can recruit those fat cells to, to release the fat, to release the energy, and then knows how to use it, which it can take uh, four to six weeks for this process to happen. And if you kind of look over here, I say, well, how long are you usually in the beginner section? And that four to six weeks uh, is pretty common, even when they've fallen off the wagon. If they fall all the way back to, to number one, uh, if they have a setback and their tradition says, forget it, I'm not going to do keto until January, and then they start out with eating every two to four hours, it's usually a four to six week process before their mitochondria are really doing a great job of supporting their energy. Uh, the other process that's happening during these, uh, these, you know, th these four to six weeks is the, the supply chain for hormones is re re refilling. Now supply chain in 2020 have become almost <laughs> like the, t the word of the year. But I mean that you can't make a fat based hormone like estrogen or testosterone or norepinephrine or cortisol or cholecystokinin. These are all built from fat, but they do have a huge amount to do with our satiety, how well our brain works, how well our immune system works, our sex hormones, they're built from fat. And when the fat is all locked up because you're carb fueled, because you store the fat, you have a bunch of fat on your body where you can put those hormones, but you cannot use them. The supply chain is broken. Um, that This is being reestablished in these first four steps of the keto continuum. And I would contend that um, uh, as soon as that supply chain is, is, um, is stable is when they miss a meal. And it's usually accidental. I love the moment. It's, it's the place where then I start to say, I need you to now, this little red line I was pointing out earlier is a sign that you actually have to step over that. The, ke the keto chemistry will carry you all the way through that missing a meal. And I'll have people write in or they'll send me, I've been keto for a year and I've been, I haven't lost any weight since I first started. And what they did is they got to keto continuum number three and then they quit. Uh, they didn't know they quit. They said, I'm doing so much better than I was at the beginning. But now their keto continuum is that their, their metabolism is not advanced. They just got to this new place and they quit. Um, so the next place I like them to go is they eat two meals per day. Uh, it's two places where calories go in. Uh, I, I don't talk anything about what's in their morning drink. I want two calorie, two pockets of calories per day. Um, I do a lot better job of going through all this in the, in the online course. So if you, if this is the first time you're hearing it and you want to learn more about it, be sure to click, uh, the links in the show notes. That's where you can get to the, uh, online course. I'm a big fan of learning in your own homes with your own tribe. So I want you sharing that course uh, with your family, uh, using it as a team that all of you can improve your understanding of the ketogenic journey by sharing the online course with one another. I, the program is set up that you can use that username and password for anybody who wants to use it in your tribe. And I think it's beautiful. I think it's amazing when people uh, learn something and then they share it with another person because that that solidifies the education in their life and in their in their brain. And they get better at the skill because they shared it, because they taught it. Um, so that's meant to be for your whole tribe to use. Please, please use the online course for your, everyone in your uh, circle of trust and in, in your keto tribe to get better. But most importantly, I'm going to buzz through these really quick. And I want you to know that there's a lot more to them than I'm going to go through right now. So when, when I look back at what happened to my, my toxic tradition, this is, again, um, my eating patterns that had a really tough time uh, when I was first 
like stepping through the keto continuum and writing this algorithm, knowing that I, I could do a pretty good job of keeping the calories all within eight hours. Um, and I also would, uh, I, I, if you see over here, I talk about people not, uh, um, addressing gum chewers. People don't think about that in the keto diet, but the gum chewing has a stimulating effect for uh, their metabolism. And it doesn't mean you can't chew gum. It means you need to chew gum only during those eight hours. So when I look at, um, let's see if I can do this. There you go. When I look at um, uh, the rules over here for that one, uh, you, your gum needs to be part of the, the, the journey that gets better. Um, by limiting the amount of time that uh, you spend in, uh, that, that you allow yourself to chew gum. All right, so then if I look at where I ended up before I fell off the wagon, I mean, I, I've been all the way down to OMAD uh, 23 and 1, uh, where I had one hour during the day what I would, that I would put in calories. Uh, I did it in the sunlight hours of the day. I did a really good job of that but it, it wrecked my family is what it did. So I've learned to, usually I'm at keto continuum number seven, which means I eat most of my calories in a one hour uh, period. Um, but something happened after mom died and I just started doing things that I used to do. I went back to old traditions. Um, each week during some of these, uh, I mean, anybody who's been following me has seen that I would put my metabolism through a, a stress, uh, at least, um, at least a 36 hour fast, but not uncommon for me to do a 48 or a 72 hour fast. And those fastings uh, didn't have uh, as much to do with the time, the stronger I got in my metabolism, as they did have to do with uh, what my Dr. Boss ratio was. So I was using the, the, the blood ketone measurements to really uh, improve my metabolism and stress my metabolism. And in between the stresses, I would fall back to one of my baseline metabolisms somewhere, depending on family and depending on if they were home. Uh, I, I would probably be an advanced 16-8 or probably an advanced 24, meaning at 20 hours of the day, I would have no calories and four hours of the day is probably where I would keep my calories. Um, and, and then I would stress my metabolism once a week. And I'd kind of do that with you guys on, on um, I'd started on my Sunday night my Sunday night uh, shows and I would start my fast and I would take it until my Dr. Boz ratio was at 40 or less. And I would show you those numbers um, on Instagram. And I, I fell, I fell back to probably 16, eight, and I didn't hardly want to get past a 24 hour fast. Now, the good news is, is I didn't fall all the way back to 300 carbs. And when I look at what I hope people happen when their traditions crash into their life and life goes wrong, is that they've spent enough time in that baseline metabolism that they fall back to a five through uh, eight, or even a four isn't terrible for their, for their crash. When they do that, their metabolism is still ketone-based. I mean, if you go to 300 carbs a day for a day, it's... First of all, you're going to have a headache. You're going to feel terrible. Um, but if you don't, if you only do it for one day, it's one thing. But if you go back and you fall completely off the wagon, I find it's that they rushed through the the beginning phase. They didn't really understand that we were building fat-based hormones and that that process does take four to six weeks for the supply chain in your system to improve. And uh, that. I, I teach about this in the book and at the online course that a baseline metabolism is a place you can spend the rest of your life. When you look at people that are 100 years old and you look at their food traditions, like how do they typically eat food? They have so much method. Uh, they don't really have um, a, a, um, a lot of variability in the way they eat. It's a very basic, I would say it's a very boring menu. And with that comes uh, usually the hours that they're limiting the food to go in. As I share the story uh, that's coming in the book uh, for Keto Continuum, uh, those food traditions, you get pushed back at. You have a wife who says, I think you're crazy for fasting. What are you doing? Why don't you like my cooking? <laughs> um, when you look at other folks who work the night shift and then they try to figure out how do they fast and do the night shift with a circadian rhythm, 
Um, and then when life goes wrong, what, what I hope and pray for is that people don't fall all the way back to the beginning, that they fall within that baseline metabolism and just stay there. And then it's the inch forward, which is what brings me to tonight of um, what I hope uh, what I hope to start and show you um, is that <clears throat> I, I mean I, I I didn't fall all the way back to the beginning. I just fell back to a place where uh, I didn't gain a bunch of weight. Um, I really didn't. Um, uh, uh, let's see, actually we'll come off this. I'm getting some complaints that it looks blurry or something. Um, I didn't fall all the way off the wagon. I didn't stop doing keto. I just had a limitation of how much my, um, um, how much I could push myself in a place that wasn't my tradition. My tradition was to, to comfort with carbs. And I'm from a farming family that has food and lots of good food during the holidays. And that tradition has been, um, you know, something we've been working on as a family. My mom and dad continued to say, let's find the other things like playing cards or having, a, you know, a tournament of cards when the family gets together instead of uh, a tournament of eating, <laughs> which happens. Uh, we don't mean for that, but we love them with food. And as I look at resetting some of the, uh, the goals I have for myself, but also when I'm coaching somebody who's had a setback, um, I don't push them to right back to where they were. I mean, I would love to push a reset button and go to, um, I'm at you know, 24, 20 hours of, of fasting and four hours of calories, and that I do my weekly fast to a Dr. Bob's ratio of 40 every week, and I do the perfect fast where it's just salt and water and black coffee, and, and I realize I can't, I just can't reach that far. Um, I have to step my own journey back gently through these steps to get back to where uh, not to where I started, to where that I feel the, that my metabolism is strong, that my brain is focused, that my sleep is deep. Uh, and those are parts of what happens when you wring out the inflammation in someone's body is it works better. So um, I have some goals for this week. And uh, as uh, I've said before, I try to show you where I'm going and what my accountability is, that I'm going to at least make it 24 hours without uh, a with black coffee and and using black coffee, salt and water and have a meal tomorrow night as my um, as my major meal. Um, if I if I have a struggle tomorrow where I don't think I can do that, I'll probably use um, ketones, supplemental ketones like we talked about earlier to put the ketones in circulation because of how much it does suppress my appetite and give me energy uh, for 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 not just sugar energy, the kind of long-term energy to get a project done. We've got some more filming for the documentary tomorrow. I've got some uh, unsettling appointments I need to do about mom's will or not, you know, just wrapping up things about an un unexpected death and how do you fix this stuff. So I know they're gonna be stressful. And if I, if I have moments where I just don't think I can do it, I'm not gonna beat myself up. I'm gonna say, it's okay. Uh, I'll, I'll do my best to get through those 24 hours with just salt and black coffee. And if it isn't the case, then I'll, um, I'll supplement with BHB and I'll keep trying again. And that's what exactly what I would tell a patient to do. And even as I tell it to you, it's hard for me because I'm like, I know I can do it. I'm sure I can do it. And that really sets me up for when I don't do it, I feel very disappointed. And so um, this is what it looks like. This is the real journey of how do you change behavior? And it's these little bitty incremental steps, not these huge leaps, and especially not the resets that, um, I mean, I know I can do it, uh, but I also know I have a, I have a broken heart. I have a, a, a grieving process that's incredibly real to me and that to push myself too hard will lead to another setback. So I'm going to look at that continuum and say, all right, um, we're going to, we're gonna reach for a, a little bitty fast, which is only 24 hours, and that's okay. That used to be a huge moment in my journey. And if I need help, I'm gonna use the tools that I know will give me energy and suppress my appetite. So 
that is, uh, that's the toxic traditions and how uh, some of them can do a setback. Some of the other things that I'm counting down to for this year where we don't have my parents uh, as part of our, our uh, Christmas traditions is to find things that my children will hopefully uh, carry forward as the things they look forward to at Christmas. And that isn't just um, the food. It's actually the adventure we try to do at a, as a family. And uh, I think that's my a good place for me to put my focus and energy as I, as I also try to uh, wrap up this book and push publish so I can celebrate with success. <laughs> and I mean that, that those are the other places you all fall off of the toxic traditions is you have a celebration, you have a holiday, uh, maybe you celebrate with booze uh, and then I've got grieving going on and now I've got eating patterns. So maybe I've just got too high of expectations for me too. All right, so that uh, is a place where I'm just gonna focus on your questions now. So if you had a question, uh, I would love it if you posted it earlier, please post it again. And I will take this time to answer the questions. Um, if you're looking at, um... <laughs> the, so I am gonna wait for just a minute to do that and finish my little ketones. Also, um, I got the strips out to recheck my numbers at the end of the show, which we'll, we'll do questions here for about 15 minutes. So if you have a question, please post it. I'm just gonna read a couple comments because I think it does help. <laughs> um, so I have a uh, travel and learn types in and says, just got through a seven day fast, lost 12 pounds, glucose is 102 and ketone 6.1. My blood pressure is 102 over 67. What do you think? So first of all, I would never do a seven day fast. I mean, if it wasn't for religious reasons, I don't have patients do that. Um, one of the best, I'll tell you my best work, <laughs> my best video ever is the last video in the online course. And it explains the difference between what happens to people who fast from a non-ketogenic base to a ketogenic base. Uh, meaning if you come in with 200 carbs a day, you're not keto adapted and you fast. We have studies about looking what happens when ketones are made, when those fat-based hormones are made, um, when the surge of autophagy happens, and, um, and then what happens afterwards. And after a ton of reading, I mean, it took me a couple, it took me three years to write this book. The editing process has taken a lot longer with all the setbacks this year. But one of the most powerful parts that became very clear, not just in my practice, but also as I coached people with this, they wanted me to follow them through a seven day fast, is that the seven day fast, it's, a, it's an accomplishment, you should feel great. But just seeing that the sugar is still 102 and um, you get this nice weight loss, but it's not really, um, there's a lot of sacrifice that happens after about 72 hours of fasting in most people. Um, and sometimes it's 72 hours, sometimes it's 96 hours, but somewhere in that third or fourth day of fasting, um, the, the benefit uh, doesn't outweigh the, outweigh the risk in most of my chronically ill patients. So I'll tell you, most people wanna do a seven day fast because they wanna hurry up and get better. And I'm like, okay, let's hurry up and get better. Start at keto continue number one, go to two, go to three, get yourself to four, two meals a day, get yourself keto adapted, get those fat-based hormones on your side, and then watch how easy it really is. Uh, that it, I, I'm, I'm, I really, I don't want to discourage you that seven day fast is a huge accomplishment for you. And I'm sure that it felt great as far as, you know, checking that off your list that you were able to do it. But the, what I want patients to do is cr chronically repair. And that means that there has to be an interval that they're at a baseline continuum, that they restrict calories, whether it's 16-8 or the 23 and one and they, they really work at getting the calories during the sunlight hours. They get, the, they get to a place in their keto where they, they put in all this fat that's a high fat diet, and now I want them to restrict the time fat goes in and the amount of fat that goes in, and you'll learn about that in the online course. But when it comes to fasting, I want them to surge their hormones. I want them to get the benefit out of autophagy and then come back down and live at a baseline so that you can reap the benefits of your recent workout. I mean, what did that fast do? That worked out his mitochondria. Unless he's got a chronic inflammation, which a sugar of 100 and 102 after seven days of fasting tells me there's something more going on. You shouldn't have a sugar of 102 at seven days fasting. And so he pushed his metabolism. And although it's a great accomplishment, 
it would be better to say stay at 16.8, uh, especially advanced 16.8, I think is a much healthier place than 16.8. So that's keto continuum number six. And you stay there for six weeks. And if in those times you want to give your body a workout, hit a 24 hour fast the first week, then hit a 36 hour fast the second week. And if you feel good, then go to a 48 hour the third week. Uh, when I'm really trying to cleanse somebody's body, I'm really trying to improve their system. I will have them, I mean, I'll never recommend this to somebody who hasn't been at one of those baseline metabolisms for at least at least six weeks. I mean, you are good at baseline metabolism for at least six weeks, and often it's longer. I can remember the gal who's my assistant who had been following me for a couple of years, lost over 100 pounds, uh, was feeling the best she's felt in her life, and I finally challenged her to this ultimate stress of her metabolism, which was... She was doing OMAD, she was doing really good, she ate during the day, but she was she still had this, this layer of, I'll call it a chronic rind, meaning they, just inflammation that kind of just haunted her. Her blood sugars would do a little bit more, a little bit higher than they should have been. And she had this layer of weight that she still wanted to lose and she'd stalled out. And I said, do, and she'd done fasting a little bit, but nothing close to 72 hours. I said, I, I need you to do 72 hour fasting, one fast a week, for eight weeks straight. And two things happened during that course. Not only did she conquer her fear of fasting, uh, but she stressed her metabolism each week. So she got a really good workout every week. And then she came back to baseline uh, metabolism, which was, I'm pretty sure was 23 in one. Uh, And so she was still having a steady workout, but um, now her ketones were going from a 0.6 or a 0.7. And that's where they were with 23 and one, she would only have ketones under one um, most of the time when she checked. She did her first 72 hour fast and the ketones come up a little bit. She did her second second 72 hour fast. And I'm not talking the ketones during the fast. I'm talking her day-to-day normal production of ketones much higher than they'd ever been. By the end of that 72 hour fast, she broke through her weight loss stall. I think she ended up losing another 30 or 40 pounds. Uh, I mean, really took her metabolism from this stuck place uh, to the healthiest she's ever been. And so when somebody says I did a seven day fast, I don't wanna take away the praise. I just wanna say there's a better long-term journey than that. And it has to do with living at some of these places that are much more maintainable and then plunging, stressing that system and then getting reaping the benefits for the next couple of weeks. Then maybe you can't do a 72 hour fast every week. Maybe you need to do it every two weeks, but getting eight consecutive ones at the interval that you can do is the goal. And there is something magical that happens after eight of those. So it's a great post though, great question. All right, so several questions have come in since then. I'm gonna keep scrolling to find a couple other ones. Um, Let's see here. Okay, so somebody, Becky uh, Summer, actually, I've seen Becky's uh, post before. Uh, she wrote it and said, I still struggle with getting enough fat in going advanced 16.8. Uh, what do you suggest to continue uh, to continue at 16.8? Uh, her morning glucoses are still high at, at 97. Ketones are low because of that. Okay, so this is exactly the case that happened to my assistant. So Becky, uh, thanks for checking into the channel. Thanks for always giving us a thumbs up. Thanks for, I know you've referred a few people to the channel. So uh, I really appreciate that. That's how this channel grows. Um, And I do think we can help more people through this free medium that comes to you every week, uh, trying to answer your questions and teach you about the ketogenic journey. So Becky, uh, you are at 16.8 and you need to do a couple of other things. So you can choose to stay at 16.8 if that's where your life really fits the um, the best, um, you know, if I knew more about your life, I might say, okay, get yourself to 20 and four, meaning 20 hours with no calories and four hours with calories. That's a nice slight advance that's somewhere between 16.8 and 23 and one. And like I said, that's usually where I live because I have teenagers that always need supper and I if I wait to supper to eat my only meal, I overeat. So I try to eat a little something in the afternoon, about four hours before supper, you know, three or four hours before supper. And then I don't eat as much at supper, which it works out to be a pretty good process for me. But what Becky needs to do, again, she's at 16.8. She says, I just don't see, think I get enough fat in. And I have this sugar that's 97 and these low ketones. What should I do? And the answer is you need to stop using the fat that you're eating and get your body to use the fat. 
And that means you got to fast. And that's where, um, let's see if I can go back over here real quick. When I look at Keto Continuum and I say, okay, I really need you uh, to, um, to stress your metabolism, the first thing I, I would ask Becky to do is uh, to push her stressing metabolism to a 36 hour fast, meaning she's probably gone almost 24 hours without food before. So to push her for that overnight fast, and I really do a good job about this in the online course saying, here's how you set up a 36 hour fast. This is the way you do it. Hack it the first few times just because it'll blow your mind a little bit. Um, and, and that needs to be her stress. Um, if she can, uh, you know, work towards, I put number 10 on there as a, uh, uh, because I think a lot of people do make this mistake where they celebrate with this huge meal after a fast. And for, you know, for the first couple of times you do that, okay, celebrate with a big meal, that's fine. But for the long term, we want you fasting without a celebration. Honestly, this took me like six months to do this. I was so proud of fasting and then I had this big meal afterwards and I'm like, ah, uh, okay. So 36 hours and, and what I'm looking at is try, try to conquer not over celebrating with this huge Thanksgiving size meal when you're done fasting, mainly because you're going to have diarrhea and poop most of it out. But the other part is, is that it's not a healthy uh, response. We want you being able to deny food. And what, what's going to happen to Becky's uh, system is her body will start recruiting uh, fat, not eating fat, recruiting fat from stored fat. And that's why her sugar is high right now. That's why her ketones are low is she's using swallowed fat. you got to Okay, I, all right, you, you're keto adapted. You wouldn't be doing that well if you weren't. Uh, you need to step over the threshold. And this is where a tribe is super important, that your people uh, in your support system, you need to have a couple of people that do it with you. Um, I, I promise I'll be back to the fasting by the first of the year is my goal to really kind of flush through all this drama that I, I still am struggling with. And I'm trying to be gentle to myself from the grief that is going through my heart and my life. But it's really important uh, to have other people that you fast with. So I try to start my Sunday night lives with my fasting and then uh, show you how far I make it on Instagram. So I post the numbers. I show you how far I make it. I, I, I fast to a certain Dr. Bob's ratio. So if you're only trying to go 36 hours, I usually make it that far. 20, 48 hours is not uncommon. 72 hours happens, especially if I'm trying to heal from something. Um, but uh, you won't believe how powerful it is, uh, um, Becky, when you do that. And I can only just uh, refer you to my assistant, Angela, who by the third or fourth, one of her 72 hour fasts, I mean, every time I'd see her on, on the videos, she just glowed. Her, her health really made a change for the better. And so I think you're at that. I think you're at a place where that's going to be the important next step for you. Um, I, I do think uh, of these, um, oopsie daisy, I need to be over here. I do think of these uh, uh, 9, 10, 11, and 12, uh, they're all workouts for your mitochondria. They're all workouts for your metabolism. And the good thing about giving a workout to your body on a keto, on the keto continuum is that this workout doesn't just last for 24 hours. And that's what I would contend the guy who did the seven day fast is he got this, he did a really strong thing. He fasted for seven days for heaven's sakes. Then, but the, but the benefit isn't as powerful as what would have been had he done four 48 hour fasts. Um, he would have really cleansed his system. He would have heightened his autophagy. His body's mitochondria would have had a, a really good workout had he done three 48 hour fasts, you know, which is, you know, almost similar to a 72 hour fast if you add up the hours, but the benefits are exponentially high when you're at a baseline metabolism uh, and then you stress, stress the metabolism in a rhythmical way, like once a week, once every other week, whatever fits in your life. All right. So again, there's a bunch of questions that are still out here. Uh, I am going to do, I'm going to sign off for a couple things. I'm going to check my numbers and um, uh, my fingers are a little cold. So I'm like, okay, I hope I can get some blood out of my fingertips. And I will uh, stay on afterwards and just answer a few questions online by staying in the post in the chat, trying to answer a few more. But I do appreciate all of you that have stuck around. It, it is my, my request that you uh, share the, um, uh, that you give it a thumbs up, you share the, our channel that um, if you do download, I'm trying to make sure I, my finger doesn't have any of that ketone powder on it. Um, 
so if I look at the places, oh my goodness, my fingers are so cold. It didn't even, I didn't even get any blood out. Oh my goodness. Oh my, oh, hey, there's some. <laughs> I am alive, no longer a vampire. Um, okay, so just uh, showing you again, this is the glucose one. I did ketones first last time, but here's the glucose one. And I think there's enough for the, yep. And so here's a ketone one. Again, it's waiting for the blood. And, uh, oh, sweet, enough. Okay, so there's a countdown of glucose and ketones. Sugar went up, uh, which isn't uncommon when I'm stressed. <laughs> and the ketones, uh, oh yeah, 3.4. So when you look at what uh, ketones in a can can do, uh, that's a good product. And I'm not just saying that, I got really frustrated with products that didn't raise ketones. I just swallowed them, okay? I'm not being great. Um, that is a powerful part of how you improve yourself is uh, you use the supplements that are high quality at the right places for the right length of time. And that doesn't mean a lifetime, that means at the right places. So I'm definitely going through a valley and I'm using ketones to help not fall all the way back off the keto continuum and, and to still meet um, the, the process of uh, um, improving my health and, and being able to reach goals like push public on a book to, and do a documentary and be a good mom and be a good wife. All right, so that's my day life. We will be signing off and I am coming to you from Plankington, South Dakota tonight. This is the Dr. Boz channel. We are improving your health one ketone at a time. We'll see you next Sunday, everybody. Happy holidays. Oops, now I can sign off. <laughs>